Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, the book of Matthew. We're going to start with chapter 16 here in a moment. And how fascinating it is. Christ has just fed 4,000 again, their wives and children. <coughs> and um, so we know and understand that um, this would be about 8,000 people, and then probably you would be cutting it short because the families were pretty large at that time. So we would be feeding even more than that. <clears throat> and um, that is precious to know that he takes care of people. He feeds them. That's not the main message he wants you to gather from this this time because you notice each time the feedings took place, there were extra baskets of uh, bread picked up. <clears throat> and the meaning is, as you're going to find out in this 16th chapter, when, anytime you have a large gathering of people, you've got to be very careful. He taught you back in chapter 13 who your enemy was and how they operate. And these fragments mean anytime there's a large group gathering, you're going to have a few in the fringes that are fruit baskets, okay? They're, they can't gather a crowd, but they're going to be there to try to disrupt yours. And, or lead a few sheep astray. It doesn't happen when people have the truth. There's no substitute for the true word of God. So having said that, here he's fed these people, and um, we go to chapter 16, verse one, a word of wisdom from our Father, and let's get right into it. Verse one reads, the Pharisees also, um, with the Sadducees, got both tribes here, came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Remember back in chapter 12, they did this same thing. They want a sign and they have the Son of God standing in front of them. They have Messiah there. They have the feeding of the multitudes. They have um, lepers healed. They have lame uh, made to walk, those paralyzed to stand up. He's performed miracle after miracle, and they want a sign? They've, had a, they've got a, a sign that many people would sure love to see. We do have the Holy Comforter, but he was right there in front of them. Watch how he handles it. Verse 2, he entered and he said unto them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. You, you can look at signs in the heavens and read them. You know what they say. Verse 3, and in the morning, it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and luring. In other words, it's overcast and is moving down. Oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? Now, underline that word times in your mind because that's what they're talking about, not signs from heaven but signs of the times. Because what is the time he's talking about? It's the first advent, the time of Messiah. He's standing in front of them, right there in front of them performing miracles, and they can't recognize him. They can't see it. They're blind to the spiritual fact that he is there and the first advent has come to pass. There will be also many that will be blind when the second advent takes place as far as falseness preceding it of the false Christ appearing first. You've got to understand the times. And that's what chapter 13 was about, the parable of the sower, to, to inform you of the times and seasons whereby you at least knew when, when you were in that generation of the fig tree. Verse 4, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. What was, the, what was the sign of Jonas? 
was the fact that Jonas was, um, this would be Jonah in the Hebrew, uh, was in the Old Testament, three days and three nights in the whale's belly, when, which would be a dead man, actually. But in this case, not so. He was regurgitated by the hand of God and placed out on the beach where some of the Ninevites could see him. And Jonah wanted to die rather than t to bring the uh, Assyrians to God because he knew from prophecy the Assyrians were going to conquer Israel. And he was, he was a hero to the people. But the sign was that inasmuch as the Ninevites worshipped a fish god, and when this fish regurgitated him and they saw it, this was their Messiah. It had to be their Messiah because the fish brought him. And they worshiped him, followed him. Whatever he said, that was it. But Christ came even after the three days and three nights in the tomb. And people won't, still won't believe that after he resurrected as Messiah, bringing the kingdom in at that time, the king and his dominion though he, it was not time for him to conquer all, but to save all that would listen. So the signs of the times is very important, and that's what you want to derive from the manuscripts in studying our Heavenly Father's Word. So, and he left the scribes and, and the Pharisees, Sadducees there. Verse five to continue. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. And uh, you know that how many was it? There was 12 baskets before. There's seven this time left over. Meaning there's always out of God's word, there's enough for everybody that will. But at the same time, you're gonna be taught a lesson here. Verse six, and then Jesus said unto them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. In other words, you watch out, you be careful. What leaven, when it gets in, a little lump changes every segment of the dough. And you let a little false doctrine in and it can penetrate and um, draw off and change the truth. And there's only one truth and it's God's word. It is, and Christ was that living word. That's what he's telling them, be watch, be careful of when we feed large groups like that, what can happen, especially because of the question asked by them afterwards, show us a sign. What kind of sign does it take? Okay, verse seven, and they reasoned among themselves saying, it is because we have taken no bread. Verse eight, listen and learn well, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because you have brought no bread? And uh, that's, in other words, you're not listening to the real meaning. They have the true bread of life right in front of them. Verse nine, do you not yet understand neither remember the five loaves and the 5,000? And how many baskets you took up? That'd be 12 baskets, 10. Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000, and how many baskets you, t uh, baskets you took up? Seven, of course. One for each of the God's elect, that is to say, each thousand. Eleven, how is it that you do not understand that I spake not unto you concerning bread? You see, there's things a lot more important than the bread that we partake of, excluding the bread of life, but what can happen while you're partaking <clears throat> concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In other words, they're like bad yeast brought into the body of Christ, and if you listen to them, when you, anytime you have a large group, you're gonna have fragments and then they understood, verse 12, listen carefully. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So that's the way it is, doctrine, <clears throat> doctrine, doctrine. Traditions of men, 
that make void the Word of God. You get a large group together, you had better be well-founded in your Word because you're going to have people as you fellowship and everything that will teach falseness and claim it was given from God. Anytime someone tells you that God spoke to them personally and what he told them overrode the manuscripts, you got a fake on your hands, okay? You got a false one. Um, so because God will never give a person a saying, a vision, or an instruction that is not already written in God's Word. You can always find a second witness there. And if someone gives you some report or some false uh, literature or doctrine that you can't back it up in God's Word, you better cull it. That's why God gives you spiritual discernment. And this is the root of discerning is to know the doctrine that is not the doctrine of Christ, but the doctrine of some other entity, you could, Satan, a, a cult, uh, whatever the case may be, some dreamer. <clears throat> You've got a lot of people that take it upon themselves. They will not stay humble before Almighty God. They've got to feel that they are something special. Right there, you, this is another way that you can tell if they claim to be some special character from God's Word, just, just you can erase that, okay? Because God is picking sons and daughters to stand against the false Christ, and they are living now, and they are God's elect, and they know and understand the doctrine that, is, that uh, differs from God's doctrine. Why? Because they're founded in the truth, and you cannot change or take that truth away from a true Christian. It's just not going to happen. Uh, I don't care what kind of doctrine you put before them. They're not going to accept it. Okay, continuing on. That being a hard-learned lesson, watch it when you're around a multitude, for fragments will be there, and it will be false doctrine. Uh, you could even have them at Passovers, when you serve, have Passover or Fall Fellowship. There'll be some there. Be careful, beware. You are well in good hands because you're in the hands of the living God and His Word, the letter He sent to you to decipher good from evil. That's why He gave you the 13th chapter of this book of Mark, so that you know the sower, how the seed was planted, the seed being the Word of God. <clears throat> and if somebody sends you something different, you cull it spiritually immediately. Verse 13 to continue. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea or Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? What did they call me? Verse 14. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, that being Elijah, and others Jeremiah, that's to say Jeremiah are one of the prophets. That's what they say. 15. And he said unto them, But what say ye that I am? What do you say I am? Verse 16. Watch the names here. They're important. And Simon Peter. Why did, he, why did the whole name come forth? Simon means hearing, and Peter means rock. Okay answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Anointed One, the Messiah, the living one, the Son of the living God. Uh, and uh, that, that was a good qualification. That's exactly the way it is. Verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, that's a hearing, Bar Jonah, that son of the dove, for, fre for flesh and blood hath no, uh, have not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. He's the one that told you this. Well, why, why, what is, why would he call him Bar Jonah, that son of the dove? And the dove, of course, that uh, is, is symbolic of the Holy Spirit appearing. 
when doves would appear and then it would be said from above, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, so, uh, so he's calling him the son of Jonah, basically, all right, Peter. Verse 18, listen carefully. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, many people unlearned, inasmuch as Peter, uh, being Petros in the Greek, you have to go to the Greek to understand this, coming out the gate, you got to get that down good. Petros, being uh, Peter's name, is a rock, all right, but it's a movable rock. It's not an unmovable rock. But the word rock, as it's used here in the Greek language, is um, Petra, not Petros. It's Petra. It's an immovable rock, and that rock is Christ. Uh, it is the uh, Christ's own we could call it church if you wanted to, that would put it even in the feminine, which, uh, which uh, Petra is. So it certainly wasn't Peter, because he's a masculine name, Petros. But this is that church and the church that is Christ is headed by, that is to say Christ himself being that rock. Uh, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And when you are a part of that, the gates of hell can't prevail because you have power over them in the name of Christ. So that's a very powerful verse and many people misinterpret it saying Peter is the one that God built the church on. And that's not true. He, he certainly was an official there, but he was not um, the rock that the church was built on. You have the documentation in the Greek manuscripts, okay? No problem at all. Verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Remember all those parables concerning the, key, the kingdom of heaven back in the 13th chapter? He said, here's the keys. The keys are the knowledge. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Meaning, when you teach God's truth, if you bind an evil spirit, it's going to carry over. It'll be bound in heaven also. But if you loose someone from sin and from their wicked ways of life, then not only are they loosed on earth, but they're also loosed in heaven. That is to say, the rock and he that paid the price. He's about to tell them how he's going to pay the price it's very soon here. And you're going to see out of the mouth of Peter, the same mouth that the Holy Spirit used to bring forth the word Petra and Petros, that it's going to bring something different. Satan's going to be working there. Satan even worked on Peter, and you're going to find out. So this is why you want to be double careful, okay? Uh, understand and look and see if you can determine what kind of weapon that Satan used to deceive Peter. Verse 20 to continue. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. I mean, here he had made the declaration. It wasn't quite time. Why well, he hadn't paid the price yet. <clears throat> 21, but it was time for them to know. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. This is why the sign of Jonas, who was in the whale's belly three days, was, um, and then why he would call Peter son of Bar Jonas. Uh, <clears throat> 22, watch what Peter does now. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. 
Peter was a good swordsman and he carried his sword. Therefore, he could lob off the ear of Marcus, uh, one of the uh, temple servants. I mean, he, Peter was good with the sword and he was ready. So what did Satan use here? How could he take this Peter uh, and um, uh, Petros and turn him against Christ, what Christ has said is going to happen. Hey, whatever Christ says, that's the word of God. It's going to happen that way. So you better get set for it. But because of Peter's love for the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, I'm, I'm, we're not going to let this happen. We're, we're not going to let him do that to you. And that, that's kind of common nature also of flesh. But at the same time, Satan's pulling his strings, okay? He's not listening to the Lord, in other words. <clears throat> you, can, you can go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, and understand why all this came to pass. Even a thousand years before the crucifixion, it was written in Psalms 22, verse 22, that he would go before the whole congregation and explain that he was sent to destroy death, which is to say the devil. And that he himself, if he asked you to come to this earth in the flesh, that God did it himself. He came in the flesh, showing you how to get it done right. You can read all of that in Hebrews chapter 2, after following the 14th verse. So uh, even Peter should have known that, that he had to be crucified from uh, Psalms 22. But his love was used by Satan, and Satan can use love to turn you. So you have to always stick to the truth. And I'm not knocking the fact that you can't love someone, but if you're a servant of God, it's going to happen the way he wants it to. And it's always for a very positive reason. Well, why would Christ's death be a positive reason? It, it forgives sin, yours, mine, everyone's. Otherwise, we would be in a heap of hurt. But he paid an awesome price. And when Peter said this, it's not going to happen that way. Uh, that's uh, pretty strong stuff after Christ had said it would. Verse 23, to continue. But he turned and he said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You're listening to your own flesh, and you're listening to Satan. You get him out of my presence. You're an offense that way. The same one. The one that uh, the Holy Spirit used. What, what weapon did Satan use? Love. So therefore, you've got to be very careful. That's one of Satan's M.O.s, and you've got to be very careful. It's always, you are a wonderful, wonderful person, and you are so intelligent, and you, you really looking good, but okay, he always comes into your life building you up, and then he just pulls the rug right out from under you, trying to get you into his way of thinking. That's his method of operation in which he utilizes throughout the Word of God. And uh, so it is no miracle that he uses love to deceive even the very elect. And here, even one of the very disciples, the old fisherman, Peter himself. Verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He's not talking about putting a little cross on your neck. A cross was to be crucified upon at that time. And it meant you must be willing to let it all hang on the line. Because not a hair on your head is going to be touched. But you've got to have that dedication, that discipline. Verse 25. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. In other words, if you're delivered up before the false Messiah and you refuse and deny the Holy Spirit to speak through you, it's the unpardonable sin. It's over. 
But if you let that spirit speak through you and follow him, your life um, is eternal. Uh, that's exactly the way it's going to be, too. Your soul is confirmed, and you're going to do what he asks you to do. 26, for what is a man profited if he gain the whole world? Satan will offer it to you and lose his own soul, eternal life. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What do you figure your soul is worth? Do you want it to to die in the flesh body and be condemned to hell? Or do you want eternal life with everything? I mean, eternity is a long time. And to be blotted out is also a long time. It's forever and ever. But you're the one that makes that choice. There is a judgment day. But the responsibility is upon you. You're the one that makes the choice. Our Heavenly Father is always more than fair. If, if you cut it, you don't have to worry about it. And naturally, the two witnesses are going to die in the streets of Jerusalem, in Tapata, it is written, in an arena. But um, they're the only two. Otherwise, God has your very hairs of your head numbered. Verse 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father, with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Now, did it say to you, because, according to your grace, according to your good looks? No, no, no. It said according to your works. It's according to whether you gave in to the false Messiah or if you stood against him. That's work. And that's when he comes, that's what he wants to find you doing. Remember what uh, he said, you're ignorant of the, of the signs of the times, not heaven. Time becomes supreme here. He's knowing what time it is and who comes at what time. Satan comes at the sixth trump, the true Christ comes at the seventh. And his evil spirit is always present if you allow it. It even tempted Peter at that time and still will to you today if you allow it. Um, you're judged by your works for the Father. 28, verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people misunderstand that particular scripture. They say, well, you mean then he the second advent didn't transpire and and uh, that just doesn't hold true. Those people are not still alive. No, they're they're not. But that's not what he said. When did the kingdom come? At the point of resurrection, and he appeared to each of these. They all saw it. The king, and his dominion. And if you do not believe he is king. And that this is his dominion, he lets Satan play here. But it's still his kingdom. That's his, he's the king, and this is his dominion, and they live to see it because he stayed with them 40 days after the resurrection. And then he returned to the Father, and 10 days later, that would be the 50th day, Pentecost. Um, then uh, at that time, they began to see and speak and to know that he was with them. Now, it's important that you know in the feeding also as well as the fragments and false doctrine that can appear in large groups, that what did, what did Christ arrange in those groups? In one of the Gospels, it will say he told them to all sit down, but what did he tell them to sit down in? groups of 50. 50 is either Jubilee or Pentecost. Keep order. It is the day of Pentecost that, um, that uh, the sons and daughters in that time, the signs of the time that you're supposed to know, will speak. They will give that testimony. They will serve the living God. And how precious it is that you know and understand that because 
if, if many of you have known since you were a child, there was a lot more to God's Word than you'd been taught. And it's the simplicity in which Christ teaches. How precious it is that in the 13th chapter, He gave us many parables of the kingdom of heaven so that you would know what it was like. So that you knew what happened even all the way back to the book of Genesis to know who the deceiver was, how he came to be, who the father of Cain was, and, and how that uh, your enemy uh, came to you and will disperse false teachings. But you always hang to the truth. Always remember what is written and what, when Christ would be answered a question, he would say, haven't you read it? It is written. So what is written is your answer. It's, your answer is in the very Word of God and how precious it is to follow Him and to know Him. But here you had several examples of that feeding and of the fragments to warn you to be very careful of the traditions of men and hold totally to the truth of God's Word. That's why you want to always study God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, not traditions of men that will always come up void and empty. You sure don't need that. You need the truth to survive and comfortably. Uh, we have a lot in this chapter that you want to pay close attention to. Father tells us some things that you can pick up on and they're very important or comforting, I should say, more so. And after we've fed the multitudes and um, uh, Christ has uh, done a bit of teaching there, we pick it up in that 17th chapter, verse 1. And verse 1 reads with that word of wisdom from our Father. And after six days, Jesus uh, taketh Peter, James, and John, those three, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart separated them from everyone else. Why? Well, why would he wait six days? Well, maybe, maybe it's a sign that the second advent would be 6,000 years um, um, from uh, a certain point. Who knows? But um, it's it is from, from the day that the Psalms 22 was given. How, how fantastic. Probably not, but uh, things happen. Verse 2, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. That's phos, white as phosphorus. Verse three, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, which is to say Elijah, talking with him. And um, here they're standing before him. And that's very important. Why would Christ be talking to Moses and Elijah? Well, of course, Moses was who? He was the lawgiver. God gave him through the law through Moses. And who was Elijah? Elijah was the prophet of all prophets. And here, so we had, we had the lawgiver and the prophets, prophecy standing before the Lord of the earth. And so it is. Uh, Verse 4, then answered Peter, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses, they recognized him, and one for Elijah. Let, let's, let us do that. I mean, they were thrilled. I mean, here... It would seem like the uh, heaven had entered in the time of the change by the transfigured bodies that uh, it, it was time for the second advent even. Verse five, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. 
If you ever wanted to listen, that's a, one of the thunders from heaven when God speaks. It's, it is awesome when, when the Heavenly Father uh, brings forth. A, in other words, what's happening here is extremely important. And you want to pay very close attention to it. Verse 6. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were sore afraid. You know, many people think they talk to God every day. They may pray to him. But when God speaks, uh, they hit the dirt. It, it is an awesome, frightening thing. And uh, so it is. Uh, what did Jesus do then? Verse 7. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And got their old legs back under him again. Verse 8. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. The transfiguration is over. Now, verse 9, And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Again, meaning... Um, he, you wait for the miracle of the resurrection. And then you can share this vision. Now, that's important. I want you to tuck that away in your mind. It, why, why would he say, hold this until after the resurrection? You might mull that a little bit. Verse 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias, that's Elijah, must first come? And, and you read that, of course, at the second advent in Mal the great book of Malachi in chapter 4. It very well declares. Verse 11, <clears throat> And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias, or Elijah, truly shall first come and restore all things. That's before the second advent. You can count on it. Verse 12, But I say unto you, something you want to take into consideration that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed, likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. In other words, if they had received um, uh, John the Baptist as Elijah, why? Because he came in the spirit of Elijah, as it is written in Luke chapter 1, verse 17. Not that he was Elijah, but that he came in the spirit of Elijah. And uh, you can read in John chapter 1, verse 19, uh, John was asked, uh, Art thou Elijah? And he said, No. But he did come, never take it away from him, that he came in the spirit of Elijah. Now, let's analyze this. <clears throat> what did we see? And it was supposed to be kept secret until after the resurrection. And it truly was. But after the resurrection, then prophecy came and told, explained this to us. You see, the fact as we read, and you should remember, back in the 11th chapter, Christ said John would have been Elijah if, there's an if there, a condition, they had received him. They didn't. They beheaded him, and they crucified the Lord. And, and naturally, Psalms 22, we knew long before, that's what would happen. But here we observed the transfigured, the, the transformed body of Christ and of Elijah and Moses. Uh, two people, Elijah never died on earth. God just took him. God took Enoch. Enoch has a purpose also. But Moses, it's written that he died, but God would never let man bury him. As it's written in the last chapter of the great book of Deuteronomy, God took him right over Mount Nebo, and uh, he took Moses to himself. So what can we say about this then? Uh, you, the answer, of course, lies in the 11th chapter of the great book of Revelation. When it comes to the point that um, at the second advent, there would be an angel arise and he would measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. 
but the court which was without the temple leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months that's the time of Satan's reign uh, prophetically verse 3 listen carefully this is why we came here and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. That, that gives them just a few days longer than the false witness because they come, they come earlier is the point, okay? But then who is it? Who are these two witnesses? Verse four, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. What was Emmanuel? It was God with us. And who was standing before the Lord of this earth on that day of transfiguration? They were standing there talking with him. Who, who else do you know of that has stood before the Lord of this earth? This was told in the year 95 after the resurrection was complete. So that it was all right then to share it, who the two witnesses would be. And there you have the proof thereof. Uh, of course, Zechariah paints us a finer um, picture uh, metaphorically of these two and the very uh, um, lamp that needs no oil that man can provide, but it's provided by the Holy Spirit. It's truth from God's Word. And um, what, what a beautiful menorah with these two standing beside it. And what kind of powers do they have, these two that have stood before the Lord of this earth? Verse five, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in like manner be killed. And so it is, God's plan is perfect. But sometimes you have to do a little research and know uh, the timing. This could not be made known until after the resurrection. And God chose John, not John the Baptist, of course, but John, the apostle he loved, to bring forth that message directly from the Lord and how precious it is to know those things in advance. And you might say, well, why would... Why then would Christ appear in a transfigured body with a transfigured Moses and a transfigured Elijah? So that you would know what was happening. So you would know who the two witnesses are. Just as um, uh, Peter recognized them and wanted to go ahead and build a tabernacle, it's not time, but it will be at the second advent when the many-membered body gathers around them and they lead and prosper and protect us before, before the Antichrist even sets foot on earth. So it's a great comfort, and that's why Christ would have this kept secret at this time until it was time to make it known to the time for the election to serve him and not let fear come into their heart. Why? Because God's with us. He sends those always to protect us if you believe. So we return then to the 17th chapter of the great book of Revelation. Pick it up in the next verse would be verse 13. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. That's to say if they would have received him, but they didn't. 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him saying, 15, Lord, have mercy on my, on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed, for oftentimes he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. Now, what is the difference? This is not just a common evil spirit. This is a lunatic from lunar. Just like uh, we read that... Um, the false ones have 42 moons. That's lunar. 
anything lunar like that in prophecy pertains to the devil, okay, Satan. And certainly here we have one that has the spirit of Satan himself. That's called because it comes directly from the moon, lunar. And um, uh, th this is fantastic because even today, when you have a full moon, you, you will have that moon affecting people. It causes tide to rise five, six feet. The ocean, think of the power. And, and then don't snuff at it. Uh, the presence is there. And certainly um, minds can be affected. Verse 16, And I brought him to, my, to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Well, Christ had taught them. But this is one that was special. 17, and then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Bring him over. Verse 18, and Jesus rebuked the devil. And he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Verse 19, Then came the disciples to Jesus apart, and he said, Why could not we cast him out? Verse 20, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If you have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, and it's a real thing, you believe, you shall say unto this mountain, or nation, it should be translated, the nation of the Kenites, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Verse 21, listen and learn. Howbeit, this kind, well, what kind is that? Lunatic, lunar goeth not out, but by prayer and by fasting. Now, you see, how can that be? What, does, what is Christ saying? Well, do you not remember? When, when did Christ go into the wilderness and fasted 40 days? And, and who was in the wilderness with him? Satan. Christ went to his weakest point. 40 days and 40 nights without food, fasting, and fending off Satan all that time, showing the way. And that way, of course, was with Scripture. And, and how precious it is that uh, Satan would throw Scripture at him and he would return that, uh, he would certainly return that same, that uh, Scripture, though with him, it was um, uh, changed correctly. Satan always twists scripture just about 45 degrees at the end where it becomes a lie. And Satan showed it, uh, Christ showed us how to defeat Satan at that time. You, you can read it there as we covered it in Matthew chapter four. How beautiful it is by prayer and fasting. What did he ultimately say? Get behind me, Satan. And so he was, and so he is. So, you see, uh, God's Word gives, leads you and guides you and fills you. Satan will try to twist it on you. He'll send along uh, people that will claim to be men of God or women of God. And they they take God's Word and twist it just like the devil does. And I'm not calling names of anybody anywhere. If, if somebody doesn't teach the truth, they're just not teaching the truth, the whole truth. It's very necessary in this generation because we're approaching that time when these events will be very real before us. And the action that we take, you cannot allow yourself to be deceived. It's his deception. I hope you can gather from this very casting out can be very persuasive in these end times when the actual lunatic of lunar 
the old slew foot, Satan himself as Antichrist, shows up on this earth. It's going to be very convincing and very tempting. That's why it is called the hour of temptation. But he is not tempting to us, and to us it is not an hour of temptation, but an hour of the abomination that maketh desolate by the desolator, who is none other than Satan himself. So uh, you see within this how important it is to be comforted by God's word with the prophecies that pertain to days, the days that those two would be with us. And naturally, their power comes from the Holy Spirit. For what was it in Zechariah that I said concerning the menorah that had those two olive trees, those two people on each side of it? The oil didn't come, it came from them, but they weren't the ones that poured it, the Holy Spirit. That is to say, the Christ that stood between these two, talking to them, before them rather. And that is what causes the truth to flow into the 7,000 that that old plumb bob by Zerubbabel holds straight and level, straight on to get it done. So it's a very simple thing. When you look at the word and not listen to man, this man or any other man, read it for yourself. Who are the only two that were standing before the Lord Jesus Christ that did not die and are still around? because they must die again in the streets of Jerusalem. You understand? That's why God did not allow them to be killed. I know many will argue with me that, that Moses was killed. I will argue that he was not. He died, but do you think, how many, how many people did Christ speak and they bounced right back to life? Do you think God didn't have that power before Christ came along? Of course he did. Why do you think God would not let anyone bury Moses as it's written in the last chapter of Deuteronomy? because he took him, just like he took Enoch and just like he took Elijah. So uh, why did he not let them die? Because they must die in the streets of Jerusalem in the Patha, as it's written in that same 11th chapter we were at, to set that example whereby things are put back in order and our Heavenly Father takes control. So there you have something that is so simple when you let it flow before you you see, he said, don't tell anybody about this until after I resurrect, after the crucifixion. And it would have been impossible until that time and before the second advent when Elijah truly will come before that great, wonderful day of the Lord God Almighty. And now it gives you a little more leverage and your thought process can work there whereby you can understand the truth and how precious it is that he touches you. Remember always, how be it? I mean, this is the way it is. This kind goeth out, n not out, but by prayer and fasting. And you will read of that in Amos chapter eight, that the famine in these end times is fasting is not for bread. We've got the bread of life, but it's for the word of God, which is the body of Christ. But he alleviates all that anxiety by teaching the word as it's written and how precious it is. Okay, then we go with the next verse, verse 22, and it reads, And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the hands of men. And that's, I'm going to be delivered up. Verse 23, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again, and they were exceeding sorrow, so, uh, sorry, and certainly they were. Why? They, they loved him, and they had walked with him, lived with him, been taught by him, he, and he was so very good to them that he could handle any situation such, such as the lunatic demon and teach them and tell, show them exactly how it would come to pass, how things would be. And they loved him and trusted him. That's what faith will do for you. They were sorry, but he is preparing them after showing them the transfiguration and then the casting out of the lunatic 
at the very hands of the devil himself that we have power over him and can exercise it. There's nothing to be sorry about, but he, he lives and he lives today. He lives forever. Next verse, please. Verse 24. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? I mean, doesn't, doesn't he pay his taxes? 25. And he said, Yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? That means a hearing. Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? And, and naturally, uh, the king, his own children, he's not going to tax them because they're family. And the play on words is this, in truth, Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He owns everything. And he certainly doesn't have to take tribute, nor does he pay tribute. That is to say, he doesn't have to. But what, how does he handle that, though? Because not everybody could understand that, because they certainly did not recognize him as king. Got it? Verse 26, how did Peter answer him? Peter said unto him, of strangers. Jesus said unto him, then are the children free. In other words, because of that, the king's children are free. So uh, in a sense, when you are one of his children, then certainly um, as far as the kingdom in the eternity, and that's what we're looking at here after the resurrection and millennium, uh, and I want you to look at it uh, not in a monetary sense, but in the sense of truth. The children are free because what sets them free? The truth. You can read that again in St. John chapter 8, verse 32. Learn the truth, and the truth will set you free. But because of lack of understanding of people, of the significance and the glorious um, gift from God that Messiah was walking the earth in the first advent and people not understanding he handled it in this way 27 notwithstanding or nevertheless or because of this lest we should offend them go thou to the sea and cast an hook and take up the fish that first cometh up first one and when thou hast opened the, his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that to take and give unto them for me and thee. This would be a, a, um, a, a, a starter, which a Roman coin, which is half an ounce of silver, and it, it would have been for um, a, enough for two people in tribute. That's what it would be, okay, for enough for both of them. And so it was that uh, they that uh, do it this way so that the world is not offended. Why? Because it's more important to teach truth that truly sets free, and uh, do whatever the world requires as long as it doesn't counter your religious belief. If it crosses and counters your religious be uh, belief, then you do not tolerate it. When people try to take our freedom of religion away from us, we mark that lot. That's as the heathen do, and you do not want heathen in control. So anytime someone tries to take away religious freedom, the people will rise up, and you as a Christian are part of that. But at the same time, you do it gently, advisedly, and you do it so that it doesn't offend the, your own people, but at the same time, you make a stand. It uh, takes away your, if it goes so far, it starts taking away your religious beliefs, then you cannot abide them to keep from offending them. You act upon it, 
whether it offends them or not, you could care less. That's the way it is, and that's what this particular part of this parable means. Never let anyone ever take away your religious freedom. There has, in the first place, there's been too many men and women have died bringing that freedom to pass all the way from the colonies down to this very hour. And um, God expects us to stand up for our Christian beliefs and keep perversion 